Wall Street used to be full of traders. Buying and selling stocks or bonds in person or in the packed trading pits in Chicago, New York, and London. Prestigious investment banks boasted of trading desks the size of football fields. Now they're losing money on trading operations and laying off scores of traders. There's a very famous anecdote out of Goldman Sachs where about 15 years ago they used to have about 500 human traders on a trading floor making markets in stocks. So basically connecting buyers and sellers using the telephone. And that's gone away, you know, obviously with the rise of electronic trading in, in, in stocks. And now today they have three people. The number of trading, sales, and research jobs at the top 12 U.S. banks have dropped precipitously in the last nine years. In 2010, those big banks employed about 21,000 people who worked in equities, or stocks, and 27,800 people who worked with fixed income or bonds. By the third quarter of 2019, those banks employed about 16,000 people in each category, a drop of about 5,400 jobs in equities and nearly 11,600 in bonds. Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, and Societe Generale are just a few of the big financial firms to announce trading desk layoffs in recent months. Deutsche Bank, in particular, decided to ditch its entire global equities trading operation, about 18,000 jobs in total. The shift to electronic trading and passive investing are the big culprits behind the trend. Now more and more big Wall Street firms are finding it harder and harder to make money from trading. The rise of passive investing and algorithmic trading are squeezing profits in the trading business to razor thin margins. Experts say electronic trading made markets much more efficient and it's made trading more accessible and cheaper for the masses. But the shift to electronic and algorithmic trading isn't without risk. Steve wanted to see what was going on. We saw some real panic, a little below 11,000 on a quick dip. Guys came in to buy gold in a, in a hurry. So what's happening to Wall Street's once prestigious trading profession? When we think of traders on Wall Street, most people think of this. South on in April of 142! Known as open outcry, the negotiation practice was started in the 17th century in Amsterdam at the first stock exchange in the world. The Dutch East India Company was the first company to go public in history. After the creation of the exchange, investors could finance a group of upcoming voyages by the Dutch East India Company. Instead of individual voyages, diversifying their risk and return received dividends. A few hundred years later, stock exchanges had popped up all around the world and the stock exchange remained the main setup for trading up to the 1990s. You have to understand that negotiation mattered for a long time. With NASDAQ, it mattered up until uh, the NASDAQ scandal. There was a big scandal and an almost billion dollar settlement where the NASDAQ dealers were colluding to fix the prices basically and fix the bid offer spreads on NASDAQ stocks. Once that settlement happened, people had to start handling orders differently, and that gave birth to what's called electronic communication networks, which were the precursors to the modern exchanges. And as more and more markets became more and more fair, electronic markets blossomed, and frankly, paper tickets went, went the way of the buffalo. Larry Tab is the founder of Tab Group, a research and strategic advisory firm focused on capital markets. When you traded on NASDAQ, you really had to call a market maker. Before they became an exchange in early 2000s, all it really was was an order routing mechanism, and it routed orders to the market maker who had the best price. But each trade had to be okayed and, and, and traded really by a human market maker. Prior to, to Reg NMS in around 2005, the New York Stock Exchange still took roughly nine seconds to execute an order. And so most trading was still done manually, even though a lot of the order routing was done electronically. The Regulation National Market System, or REG NMS, was the first set of ground rules for U.S. trading. It protected and helped investors and ultimately smoothed the transition of computers into trading. Online trading really started to take over thanks to electronic communication networks, personal computers, increased trading pit regulation, and the rise of online brokerage firms. Although electronic communication networks, or ECNs, started in the late 60s, they didn't become mainstream until much later. ECNs automatically matched buyers and sellers, removing the need for negotiation. Now, all equity exchanges are pretty much fully automated. The New York still has the floor, but most of the activity occurs uh, in the open and in the close. Most of the intraday trading happens electronically.
First, let's talk about our definition of a trader. We're not talking about people who occasionally trade on their Robinhood and E-Trade account. We're talking about professional investors who buy and sell financial assets for organizations like hedge funds, banks, and private equity firms. According to the Securities, Industries, and Financial Markets Associations, or SIFMA, there were 484,500 U.S. employees in the securities industry in the 1990s. As of December 2017, there are 952,500 people working in the securities industry in the U.S. At investment banks, however, there's been a drop in employment. Traders, sales, and research roles dropped from 49,200 in 2010 to 32,200 in 2019, a decline of almost 35%. Bonuses on Wall Street increased vastly from 1989, when the average bonus was 24,928. They peaked in 2006 at 248,223. The average bonus fell to 225644 As of 2018, the average bonus has made its way back to around 153700 However, it's still down from 2017. Ever since, I would say, 2010, 2011, compensation across Wall Street has been falling. And the reason for that is the fee pool you know, for fixed income and equity trading has gone in one direction, which is essentially lower. And so when that happens, they have less money at the end of the year to give people bonuses. Bonuses are still at least the lion's share of, of what senior people on Wall Street make. They just eat what they kill. One of the recruiters I spoke to said, you know, he counsels the people that he's talking to to say, like, if you can't live on this business making $300,000 to $500,000, which is, by the way, so a lot of money, then you should leave the industry. You're never going to make a million dollars a year plus anymore. From 2010 to 2019, trading revenues and fixed income and equities at banks like Bank of America, JP Morgan, and Deutsche Bank have dropped from $149 billion to $83 billion. The move to electronic trading puts scores of floor traders out of a job. If you look at pictures of the trading floor in 2000 versus today, uh, it's probably a tenth the number of actual traders. Today there's more news reporters and columnists walking around, except that the open and the close, there's almost no activity that happens on the floor. It all happens in Mawa, New Jersey, where the exchange computers are. And that's not really activity, it's all happening by algorithms and upstairs desks. With computers filing trading orders, trading volumes have soared. Prior to electronification in January 1997, the average daily volume in U.S. equities was around 1.17 billion shares. By December 2019, it was 6.54 billion shares. It used to be that traders looking at screens would say, this is the price. And that price would be where they would enter their order. Today, if you want to trade a million shares of Microsoft, you're not going to do 10 100,000 share orders. You're not going to even do 110,000 share orders. You're going to do 10,100 share orders, and a computer can do that far faster without getting tired than a human being can do. The velocity of trading is dramatically faster than it used to be, and it's basically taken humans out of that, that last mile of the market. Algorithmic trading is taking over the stock market, and it's not without flaws. The flash crash of 2010 caused the Dow to plunge 9% in a matter of 36 minutes. The drop was triggered by a large sell order that was then met by high-frequency trading firms who started buying and selling to each other. Other market makers weren't able to step in, resulting in the crash. Uh, I don't know. There is fear. This is capitulation, really. No, the machines have to be broken. A night indicates that a technology issue occurred in the company's market-making market -making unit. Since 2010, more flash crashes have occurred, and regulations have been announced to deal with the issue. However, no perfect solution has been put in place. Another driver of the long-term decline in trading jobs comes from the competition between active and passive investing. Many trading firms use active investing, a strategy that involves tracking individual investments, like stocks, closely for profitable opportunities. While it can mean big profits, it can also be quite costly and risky. Passive investing refers to index funds and exchange-traded funds. They allow investors to purchase large stock indexes or groups of stocks. It's called passive because they don't need to constantly monitor the investments. One of the reasons the technicals and momentum investing might have worked so well over the last decade is that the biggest investors were passive or ETF investors. These are investors that simply buy a stock 
if they're seeing inflows into that, their underlying ETF. When it comes to pure performance over the long haul, passive investing is beating out active investing. Only 23% of active funds could beat out the average return of passive funds in the 10 years before June 2019. A lot of these trends have kind of pushed down the level of participation by institutional investors in the U.S. equities markets, mostly because they're under greater competition from passive funds, which don't trade as much, their fee structures are lower, and because of that, the more active funds you know, tend to benchmark closer to what the passive funds do. They're trying to turn over their portfolio fewer times so that um, they don't have the expense of trading and they're cutting costs. And that cost pushed them more towards uh, electronic channels than more human and more expensive channels. After the financial crisis of 2008, regulators moved to crack down on the cash investment banks could use for risky bets. If you remember, the financial crisis was started in part because of these hugely risky bets that investment banks like Goldman Sachs, um, B of A, Merrill Lynch uh, had taken. And so when, when regulators saw that, you know, they said, look, we have to cut this out. They created something called the Volcker Rule. And the Volcker Rule really prohibited or at least tamped down the hedge fund-like bets that these banks could do using their own money. With banks strapped for liquidity, they didn't need as much manpower as before. Prior to the financial crisis, banks provided double the liquidity that they provide today. So on a numbers basis, this arguably means that half of the traders that were required prior to the crisis are no longer necessary. For these reasons, most big banks are moving away from trading. The profitability question for trading is also a driver of banks moving into other higher margin areas within their business models. And really this cost pressure and this deflation is driven by tech. So it's driven by technological advances that have created a cheaper environment in which to do everything. It's also been created by price discovery. It's very easy for consumers to shop around for the lowest cost option. Um, given the acceleration of information availability in today's day and age. The decline in trading jobs and revenue hurt the big banks and large investment firms. Banks like Goldman Sachs instead are focusing on a new venture, consumer retail businesses. This is still, you know, the classic white shoe New York investment bank, and something like 40% of their revenue still comes from trading, you know, trading bonds and, and stocks. What is Goldman Sachs doing? They're moving into Main Street consumer retail businesses like Marcus, where they want to gather deposits, which are a cheap source of funding, and make loans. So this is a perfect example. If you look at Goldman Sachs and their strategy, they're moving into something that's a bit more diversified, that's a little bit less volatile. From quarter to quarter, you see trading can result in a lot of volatility. You're going to see the traditional banks get smaller. You're going to see the electronic players, the Citadels, the Virtus, the Jumps, the Jane Streets, the the HRTs of the world, I think you're going to see them get bigger. If you look at the trading community that's being hired today, they're not the traditional traders, finance, MBA background. They all have a very strong uh, quantitative bent. When we think about the rise of quantitative traders, so these are still human beings that are developing the algorithms. It's currently built out by humans but it could very quickly turn into pure algorithms that learn on their own through machine learning. It's a very difficult time for the institutional brokerage um, community. On the other hand, I think it's a really good time for individual investors. I think they're getting better value and all those fees that were going to brokers and to the buy side are actually you know, staying in the investor's pocket.